All right, so unfortunately my presentation is not here. It got lost somewhere, so you guys just won't have the pretty descriptive pictures for this presentation, but it's all good. So I suppose my story really began when I was 13. Um, and what really motivated me to do my research was a close family friend actually passed away from pancreatic cancer when I was 13. And when the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers, and what I found really shocked me. You see, 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. So what this means is that pretty much 85% of all of those patients were in the exact same position as that close family friend, my uncle. And as I dug deeper, I found something even more shocking, that currently there's no way of detecting pancreatic cancer in the earliest stages. I mean, the current method is the 60-year-old technique, which is older than my dad, but also it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. So learning this, I was sure there had to be a better way, so armed with ninth grade freshman biology, I set out to change cancer diagnostics. <laughs> Pretty lofty of a goal, but I was going to do it. So then I went on and I kept researching, and I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like in order to be effective. The sensor would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. I was pretty sure I could fit all these big requirements. I wasn't exactly sure how. And so then I went back online and I went to any best friends, any high school's best friend for information, Google, Wikipedia. I can proudly say I go, went to the College of Google. And essentially I found a database of over 8,000 proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these cancers. And that's the thing about these cancers. The reason why we haven't updated our tests in over six decades is because when you're looking at the cancer, we're looking in your bloodstream, particularly for these variations in protein levels. And this sounds really straightforward, but it's anything but. You see, because you have these liters and liters of blood, and can anyone tell me what blood's made out of? Just call it out. Exactly, so cells and all of this gunk of proteins, there's this countless proteins in your bloodstream. And so when you're looking for this tiny amount, of this tiny difference of this tiny amount of protein, it's next to impossible. It's like trying to find a needle in a sack of nearly identical needles. So pretty hard for us scientists. And so then I was thinking, well, first I have to find a protein that I'm going to detect. So I went through this big database of over 8,000 proteins. And it was my summer break. And so me being the kind of weird kid that I am, I decided, well, summer break's going to be all about researching proteins. So I shut myself in my room, and I decided to bash out all 8,000. I would not recommend this if you want to maintain your sanity. See, at the end of the summer, I was really doubting my potential for any future social interaction, and it made for some really interesting back-to-school essays. I mean, my teacher would ask my friend, like, oh, what did you do? I went to Yellowstone. Jack, what did you do? I researched proteins. There was always a bit of an awkward pause after that. Nobody looked at me the same. However, on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my sandy and tearing out my hair, I finally found one protein that could work. And the name of this protein is called mesothelin. And it's just your ordinary run-of-the-mill type protein, unless, of course, you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer. In which case, it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, the key is, is that it's found in the earliest stages of these diseases, when something that's close to 100% chance of survival. So if you could detect this protein, you could potentially detect cancer when pretty much everyone can survive, and it's very easy to treat. So now that I identified a protein that could potentially work, I then shifted my focus to the real problem at hand. How am I going to pick this protein now of all those millions and millions of proteins that are in your bloodstream? And the answer actually came in a very unlikely place. High school biology class, the stifler of innovation, pretty much. Particularly with my high school biology teacher, we did not get along at all. I mean, it was kind of like me versus horror wars every single class. 
And so one day it escalated to the point where I would rebel like any ordinary high schooler would. I stuck in an article on single-walled carbon nanotubes. And I was just re do any of you guys know what single-walled carbon nanotubes are? All right, let me tell you, these things are the coolest things ever. Like, literally, make sure you Google these because they're these long, thin tubes of carbon. They're an atom thick, and they're 150,000 the diameter of your hair. So they're extraordinarily small. You can't even see a single one of them unless you use this big machine called an electron microscope. And what's so cool about them is due to this small size, they have these very amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. I mean, they're stronger than steel. They conduct electricity better than copper. They're just all around amazing things. And so while I was feeling really suave, kind of sneaking this into my book, reading it, like kind of pretty much ignoring my teacher, she was lecturing on these kind of cool molecules called antibodies. An antibody is essentially like a lock and key. It only reacts with one specific protein. In this case, that cancer biomarker it doesn't react to anything else. And so then I was just sitting there when all of a sudden it hit me. You see, these antibodies could make it such that my sensor would only detect that one protein. And the carbon nanotubes would make it such that the sensor would actually detect that protein. It could detect very small amounts of it. And how this works is you take these antibodies and you weave it into this network of nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts to one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of these nanotubes, this network will actually change how electricity flows through it, and essentially you can detect cancer using just an ohmmeter you can get from Home Depot. And you can think of it kind of analogous to a bunch of spaghetti and meatballs. You have a bunch of spaghetti, and there's a lot of contact between each spaghetti noodle and the other noodles, right? And then when you shove a bunch of meatballs in there, there's probably going to be less connections, right? And so when that happens, think of those spaghetti noodles as those carbon nanotubes. Think of them as wires. When there are less p touching, there's, when there's less connections between them, there's less pathways for these things called electrons to take th through it. And that means that it's harder for electricity to flow through these, this network, right? And so that's essentially how my cancer sensor works. But there's one catch. You see, these networks of nanotubes, they're really flimsy. They kind of look like a bunch of ash. So you can't just have them sitting around or else if I sneeze, it's going to all blow away. So I chose to use paper. And making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. Like if I ever do bad on a test, chocolate chip cookies solve everything, as well as some ice cream. And so then all you do is you take some water, you pour in some nanotubes, add some antibodies, you then mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. And just as soon as I had this kind of like epiphany moment, I realized my biology teacher wasn't looking too happy. She was all red in the face. I swear she has like eyes on the back of her head because she storms up, snatches the star out of my hands, like, what is this actual science doing in my classroom? <laughs> At least I think that's what she said. She probably said something along the lines, do your classwork or else I'm going to fail you. However, after a 30 minute long lecture on how to respect myself and others, I finally got my article back and I could begin researching again. And then I realized I'm probably going to need a lab to do cancer research. Me and my brother had done some pretty crazy stuff in our basement. Note, this is not advisable. Do not do this in your basement unless you want your parents to be very mad at you. We made high-grade explosives in our basement, nitroglycerin. Get your parents' permission first. And then also we cultured E. coli and cholera where we make sandwiches. That was pretty fun. We turned our like, basement bathroom into like an incubator where we grow bacteria. They get really smelly, let me tell you. That bathroom isn't used really anymore. It's like leached into the walls probably. And then luckily we didn't have an outbreak from that. And then we also ordered uranium off of a sketchy Russian website. So, but you really can't blame us. It was 50% off, it was on sale. I mean, who can blame me? And actually it landed us on the FBI watch list or my mom since we used her credit card. So the FBI is probably very confused at this point because it's like her novels, like how to court a duke next to like high grade explosives, how to make them. However, I realized I'm going to need a lab, so I essentially went online. I went to the faculty list of Johns Hopkins University and went through all of those researchers, kind of cyber-stalking each one to see if they were interested in pancreatic cancer. 
And I gathered this list of 200 professors, and I sent out this 32-page behemoth of a document outlining how I was going to do my experiment, my procedure, materials, possible pitfalls, everything. It was gigantic. It took me like a month to type that thing. And I send it out in mass, and I wait for all these positive email support and like me being hailed as Time Magazine, like genius boy saves the world. Then reality hit. See, I got 199 rejections. And some of those professors, I realized, they aren't nearly as nice as glowing profile pictures make them seem. <laughs> I used to be very mean going through each and every step of my procedure saying why it was the worst possible mistake I could make. I really wondered where they got that time. Maybe that's like a hobby of theirs, like let's just diss the 16-year-olds instead of like regular stuff like crocheting. <laughs> but um, eventually, I got one positive email from Dr. Anirban Maitra at Johns Hopkins University. And I go in for this big interview in like sweatpants and a hoodie, probably not the best interview attire. I expected really typical questions like, what's your favorite color? What do you want to do when you grow up? No, this guy actually knew his stuff. He had like a PhD behind his name. I couldn't bamboozle him like my parents. My parents would just say, cancer, carbon nanotubes, and they're like, okay, Jack, just go do your science. But um, then this guy actually knew his stuff. So he got 29 postdoctorate students with PhDs. And we probably set the Guinness World Book of Records, um, world record for how many PhDs can you stuff in a room to interrogate a high school student? The answer is 30, and it was a nine foot by nine foot room, so pretty cramped. And they just fired these questions at me, trying to sync my procedure, trying to see if I knew my stuff. And there were many crappy drawings involved of carbon nanotubes. I think that's kind of how scientists communicate nowadays. And finally, I got the lab space I needed. I guessed on so many of those questions, I always guessed C like I do on my SATs. I mean, who doesn't? But eventually, I got the lab space I needed. And just as soon as I started, I realized how hopeless I really was in the lab. First day, Jack, uh, culture some cancer cells for us because we're trying to get some of this mesothelium and protein. I ended up sneezing in the cancer cell. It was like really easy. Like all you had to do is like take this loop, move it, and place it in the other one. I sneezed in it and like, I'm like cancer, it's pretty hard to kill. It's like an immune system or something. No, there are like tentacles growing out of that flask the next day. I just kind of hid that away and my professor's like, oh, where are those cells I gave you yesterday? Psh, what cells are you talking about? I, I, I didn't see any cells. And over the course of the next month, I probably committed like cellular genocide on some level. I like once fell over and broke them on the floor. I cooked them in the incubator. I froze them on accident. I even blew them up in the centrifuge in this giant fountain of cell media going everywhere. For me, it was totally worth it. My lab professor at this point is like, Jack, why are you in my lab again? However, after screwing up every imaginable scientific procedures and oftentimes sleeping over at the lab on numerous occasions. We had this giant thing of science magazines. I kind of like put them under the stairs in this little mattress and just like sleep there and cry myself to see if like, why am I here? But eventually after seven months of this, I finally got the one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times as expensive and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, the cool thing is, is that it can detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when something has close to 100% chance of survival. And also, one of the amazing things about it is that how applicable it is. It's kind of like a platform that you can make it do whatever you want, because you know how easy it is to produce that these uh, sensors. You just like pour in a few things into some water. So you just switch out that antibody, put in a different antibody, and you can detect an entirely different protein. And that means an entirely different disease, ranging from Alzheimer's, other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. The possibilities for this are literally endless. Now, there is one really important thing I learned throughout this. Through the internet, really anything is possible. Theories can be shared, and you don't have to be a fancy professor with multiple degrees to have your ideas valued. You can just be some 15-year-old high school kid who doesn't know what a pancreas was. And the web is kind of this neutral space where what you look like, age, or gender doesn't apply. It's just your ideas that count. So instead of posting cat videos online or applying a black and white filter to an already white lawn chair and posting on Instagram, you could be changing the world. You just have to start Googling it. 
And so think, if a 15-year-old who didn't quite know what pancreas was could find a new way to attack pancreatic cancer, just imagine what you could do. Thank you.